Bill Hurd from Hackaday. We're talking about universal active filters today. This is actually part two. Uh, we started uh, last last week, last month. We started on the last episode uh, where we showed a crossover in a speaker as a typical bandpass, low pass, high pass, you know, the way to split a signal three ways. And uh, then we got into uh, talking about a simple pull RC filter, and then we got into the universal active filter called UAF42, which has a unique attribute that, I, well, it's a cool attribute that I like, which means that I can use a single ganged pot and actually sweep all three of those bandpass, low pass, high pass around with just some resistors. So normally you're getting involved with little capacitance, things like that. And uh, then we started testing with a sweet frequency oscillator where I could show you a whole sweep on the screen. And off to my left here, you see uh, where I've actually slowed it down and you can see it start in the low pass, go through the band pass quickly, very small, and uh, end up going through the high pass. So we're going to actually throw that on the speakers, let you hear it. Then we're going to sweep or, or, I'm, or we're going to apply the filter to some static signals, more like a square wave. Remember with the FFT DDS type uh, uh, shows we already had, uh, where I actually claimed that if you filter a square wave and get rid of the even harmonics, you will, odd harmonics, even harmonics cancel, if you get rid of the odd harmonics that you'll end up with the sine wave. Let's test that, see if it's true. So let's get started. Okay, here I've got the, uh, the sweep oscillator slowed way down. It starts at the low frequency and goes on up. And I did that so that instead of showing the sweep in one scope frame, you see it over several. But watch the green where the sine wave is very pronounced and it bangs its way through the purple and then kind of ends up in the blue and then tails on out. And uh, this, this shows a crossover in effect, so to speak, for a known signal. So uh, let me add some music here and um, let's see what that looks like. And you, if, if it works, you'll see what a crossover does in your speakers. As you know, I can't let you hear the music that I was listening to here. This is some very cool Alan Parsons uh, Tales of Mystery and Imagination playing here. But if you look at the screen, if you look at the green, you'll see the sinusoidal aspect. Try to say that. The sinusoidal aspect of the low frequency, the green, the green line. And then by the time you get up to the blue, you can see that the signal that gets through while there's some low frequency in there, the scope's really shown you there's a lot of high frequency content. So this really is acting as a three-way uh, a, a three filter, given that all three of these uh, lines look different. And if you were to listen to each one, you'd hear one would sound kind of high and tinny, and the other one would sound a little low and bassy. I, again, can't do it because of the, uh, you know, the rules regarding music on Google or YouTube. If you've seen some of the past videos where I've said things like a square wave is a sum of a lot of sine waves. That was in the uh, direct digital synthesis or the FFT video where a, sine, a square wave is the first, third, fifth harmonics and you add them all together and it becomes square. Let's test that. What happens if I strip away all the harmonics and we go back down to just letting the initial frequency go through? Will our square wave turn into a sine wave, in other words? So let's take a look. All right, I've got the green. That's the low pass filter enabled and we're looking at this happens to be a, uh, a uh, 1300 Hertz square wave on the top and as I go further and further down I'm taking out more and more of those sine uh, more and more of those harmonics and in the end I'm left with just a sine wave so if we go the other way we'll see that now I'm adding like the third harmonic the fifth harmonic and on up the chain until I get a pretty good semblance of a square wave. Now the ringing that you see here, if I added more and more uh, or, and got less and less distortion, that would go away too. Now this is an interesting uh, observation. I want you to see this. Here I've got the high pass and the medium pass turned on in addition to the low pass and we're looking at our square wave. And look what gets through the high pass. It's the edge. This edge has a natural high frequency. We call it the radian frequency, 2 pi f. Um, this is where the energy comes from, like for FCC and uh, emissions. And uh, uh, when I say FCC, I mean trying to pass FCC regulations. It's not the one, you know, this, this fundamental frequency that, that gets through that um, shows up so often in the antennas of the receivers. It's this energy in this edge. And if you can get, if you can wrap your mind around that, this is a big part of digital 
and digital and analog is understanding the properties of the rising and falling edges of a signal. I'm just sitting here playing with different, uh, <laughs> this is kind of fun actually, uh, but what I've done is, uh, and I just froze the frame here, uh, I gave it a 200 kilohertz sine wave and it only gets through the high pass. So what I was doing, it's a little messy, I'm not going to show you, but as I manually took the frequency up and down, you would see it first appear on low and then the mid and the high. There's a lot of overlap. This isn't a perfect uh, filter. Um, you know, it's, it's literally one chip, but it, it's a great start for seeing how this stuff works. All right, I said I wasn't going to do this to myself, but uh, let's do it. Let's talk about real... Uh, real active filters and, and and if I gave you the impression I don't do math well I do I'm an engineer and math's a part of the job and these days the tools uh, are just um, just fantastic the assortment you have uh, the part I was using the UAF 42 actually they call out an old basic program it's probably a Fortran written for a UNIAC or something uh, it won't run I think it needs a 15-bit DOS machine or something but even back then, they were trying to pump out basic programs. And actually, I, I the way I did, dealt with some early Laplace transforms, I wrote a basic program in 1980. Um, so I'm going to show you. I just pulled up WebBench off the off the internet. It's a TI who bought National, and I'm I'm sad that National's gone. They were my favorite data book series. Um, but there's you know analog's got got uh, you know analog.com. I'm sure has this kind of thing right built into. Uh, Spice, like the Free Ones LT Spice, they all have filter uh, uh, programs, and you know y y it was always possible to spice this stuff together. But what these programs do then is help you create a schematic afterwards. So you you tell it the parameters, and it will show you then what a, a an actual active filter looks like. I want to show you some active filters. I want to tell you about the different kinds, even if we're not going to play with them real heavily. Uh, I want you to know they're there. So looking at um, our screen here, this is, uh, again, this is WebBench from Texas Instruments. And right off the bat, you start to remember it, it, this, you heard me call this a ripple. Well, that is, this here's the slope. That'll be the 3D point, you know, which, which talks about the, the, you know, where in the frequency domain this starts to kick in. We call that little knee there, the 3 dB point. And then how steep this is kind of becomes our coin and trade. Um, most a lot of the times, not always. So if we go ahead and go into a, the filter design, what is interesting, I'm going to make sure we can uh, see, it's just right here you can choose, if you haven't heard these words, Butterworth, you know, and, and that was the first filter I ever uh, saw when I started reading filter books. I don't think I've ever actually used a Butterworth. What we used to do was use a Chevy Chev followed by a Bessel, and then if we had two more, we'd do another Chevy Chev and another Bessel. And one of the reasons was, let's see if I can do it, I, if you can see this. Here's our gain response. See, and they're trying to show you all the different kinds. I mean, what, what a great learning aid where you can actually see these responses. But look, see what the Chevy Chev does. It ripples its tail end off, but it's got a real steep, you know, and, and this happens to be a group delay, but it does the same thing in, in amplitude. And, um, and, and so what that means is you get a real sharp corner but you pay for it with some of this bouncing around. Well, if you follow it with a Bessel, the Bessel in here is the calmest one. And it's got what's called a, uh, uh, a, a um, the group delay is the same across the whole frequency band. So what that means is um, that the low frequencies are delayed the same amount as the high frequencies. The high ones aren't getting out in front of the low ones. So, uh, you know, here we can select all these different kinds, and right there are the parameters, and then this will draw it for you. And so we see that it's, it's really, it's just, it's kind of what you saw for the UAF-42. For calculating these, this, the program did it for you. How do we calculate? We calculate by doing a Laplace transform. That you can do a Fourier if you're interested in a sinusoidal result, which is more of a continuous, uh, continuous stimulus. Um, for moments, moment to time, moment to time, where am I, where am I going to, but th th we do a Laplace transform. When I say we, I usually get a piece of software or a guy named Dave Haney to do it for me. Um, but what that does is that means that we can then calculate these things using just multiplications and divisions. And we were doing floating point in 1981, I was using a 6502 at 1 megahertz doing floating point. And we had about... 180 milliseconds to do all this math so we actually could do some digital filtering in there 
and for example, we never did a division. Um, you, you would take the reciprocal and multiply. It multiply so much faster, you just kind of rock it to the left each time, right? Um, so uh, there was tricks, but we found that we could reduce these, these Laplacian coefficients all the way down, storm and ROM, and just bang our way through some of these. So, uh, you know, this is what it looks like for a regular filter, not much different than what we're doing. Um, so now let me tell you why I actually did use the filter I used. Um, again, it's not because it doesn't use math. What that one did was it had just two resistive components could control the position of that filter. And what I'm going to do next in part two of this, if we, if we want to, uh, uh, let's not call it part two, let's say another uh, version in case I screw up the design, I won't be on the hook for a part two. Um, but what that is, is, is I'm going to put in a, 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 uh, an electronically controlled resistor. I'm going to control it with an SPI bus. So now I've got a filter I can control with an Arduino, a bus pirate, whatever I want to use. And that's why I went with that part was because I didn't have to deal with the capacitors and, and the tolerances and all that. I just found something that I knew I could change a couple resistors on. And they're easy to, to fake out, right? So, uh, Bill Hurd, on behalf of Hackaday, I didn't mean to get in the deep end here a little bit, and I swear I know you're not all going to agree with me. It, just be polite when you disagree. Um, but the, uh, you know, a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm giving you about how I learned, too. And sometimes that's almost good enough. Uh, I'd like to know the right way, of course. But, uh, you know, I've done instrumentation. Before I did the real mass quantities at Commodore and stuff, I produced a, or was an engineer doing real high quality quality uh, weighing instrumentation. So we did have to, I did have to get my analog chops in order, including grounding and loops and noise and all that. And we're going to be talking about that stuff too in the future. So Bill Hurd on behalf of Hackaday, uh, we'll see you next time.